pray for them and hopefully they'll enjoy their time with their uh, families and get back among us quickly. Um, <coughs> Regulation chapter number four. Now, if you were here on uh, Wednesday night, we talked uh, extensively about the, uh, the beasts that are there uh, and they're, they are um, called cherubim. And here in Revelation 4 and Ezekiel chapter 10 and Ezekiel chapter number 1, you see the comparisons of those uh, beings, and we put all that up for you on a board for you to see. And the reason that stuff's important for you is a couple of reasons. Number one, you get to see where a lot of what people are doing nowadays comes from. The Baal worship, the bull worship, the drawing of Satan with the split hoof, the pointed tail because of the serpent references the face that uh, is like a calf, and the horns. And we went through all that stuff to just to delineate things for you so that you'd understand what it is that you're going to see. Now, when he comes, you'll be gone in the Great Tribulation. You understand that? When he comes, you'll be gone. You don't have to worry about seeing him or recognizing him when he comes. The Bible says when he shows up this time, he'll show up as a man. And when he shows up as a man... You wouldn't recognize him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11 that he appears as an angel of light. And when he comes, he comes saying, you know, peace and safety. He comes on a platform of signs, wonders, and miracles, which seems to indicate your world must be in complete and total and utter chaos by that time. And what they're doing is, is people are looking for somebody that can come on the scene and fix their problems for them, and they're looking for that one individual that can do it. It is not a government. It's a single individual who has supernatural ability and supernatural power, and uh, we want to talk about him for just a little bit. I want you to notice this in verse number 9. And when those beasts gave glory and honor, notice, and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever, the four and twenty elders fall down, we'll deal with that tonight, before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns, we'll talk about that tonight, before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things for Thy pleasure." For thy pleasure, for thy pleasure, they are are and were created. Father, we pray that you might help us now this morning as we go through this Sunday school. I pray, Lord, that you might help it to be an encouragement and a blessing to people as we look at it. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you want to come know about those four and twenty elders, you come tonight. (laughs) But here's the thing I want you to see. Remember that there's four cherubim and then there was a fifth cherub. So if you were to use this as the throne... There would be four cherubim here, face of a man, uh, uh, you know, they all four have four faces, but there would only be one face facing outward. So let's say there's a face of the man, the face of the, uh, the ox, and the, the face of the eagle, and the face of the lion. And then there would have been a fifth cherub over the top that covers, and we talked about his appearance. He would have been the covering cherub. That would have meant he was over the throne of God. And then God sent him down here, according to what the Bible says, and let him have rulership over the earth. And the sons of God came down here, and that cherub was given rulership over the earth. Now here's where the problem came in. The problem came in because he forgot to be thankful in all things. He forgot to be grateful in all things. That gratitude left out of him. Really, he wouldn't have had anything at all had God not created him. Right? But he forgot about all that. He wasn't content with such things as he had. He had to have more. Are you with me? And so gratitude is a real key to, to, uh, to pleasing God. Whenever you get to that point where you're not happy being what God wants you to be, it can lead to jealousy. Come to uh, Philippians chapter 4, bitterness, uh, complaining. Uh, it can even get to a particular point where you get cynical toward other people because you see them getting blessed and you're not getting the blessing. Because you're not getting what you, th- what you want. Uh, that leads to frustrated ambition sometimes. Uh, the, the devil's sin was covetousness. So what happens to Eve? Eve gets caught in the same thing. Eve saw the tree was good for food. Am I right? And desire to make man wise. She saw it. She wanted to be wise. She ate it. She fell. All right? Here's, here's David. He walks up on the rooftop. He's a warrior. He's a good man. There's nothing. He's a great king and so on, man after God's own heart. But he gets up there and he looks across the roof there. You know what Samuel says to that boy when he comes in? He says to him, you could have had any woman you wanted in the kingdom. Why'd you go after somebody else's wife? You know what the Bible says? You're not to cover your neighbor's wife. You know what that? I'm, I'm not happy with what I have. I'm not happy with all the selections I have. The, the, listen, in those days, he said to him, you could have had anybody you wanted Why would you want the one thing you couldn't have? 
Eve, you can have any tree in the whole garden and walk with me and talk. Why you want the one thing you can't have? Achan, come here. Yes, sir. Uh, what happened to you? Well, I saw the, the wedge of gold and the Babylonian garment, and I didn't really see the big deal. God said, here's the big deal. I told you when you go into that city, everything in that city belongs to me. That's mine. Don't ever get your stuff, Achan, mixed up with my stuff. That's my stuff. You took it yourself. He saw it, he coveted it, and he took it. You know what the devil said? I see his throne up there. <clears throat> I'm going to set my throne, my throne. He had a throne. He was a Christ. He was a ruler. I'm going to put my throne, my rule. I'm going to put it over his throne. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to uh, rise up and go above. Covetousness is what got him. Covetousness comes from a lack of gratitude. It also comes from a lack of contentment. Are you listening to me? A lack of contentment. The hardest thing in the world, Paul says, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in, whatsoever circumstances I'm in, whatsoever situation I'm in, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be what? You see, what gets us in trouble is a lack of contentment. The modern world spins that into, well, you need the ambition, and you've got to have drive, and, and you've got to be, you just don't be lazy, and you'll get the promotion. You say, where does promotion come from? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, promotion, promotion cometh neither from the south, nor the east, nor from the west, but God. So you know what takes place there? God lives in the north. You know what took the place of the north right there? God. You know where your promotion comes from? It doesn't come from your ambition and your drive and your ability. When God says, hey, I'm ready for you to go up, you go up when God says. If God's not ready for you to go up, guess what happens? You get something you're not ready to handle. We'll talk about that in the morning service. Too often what happens is, ladies and gentlemen, we get to a point where we want to see God's hand instead of God's face. And too often what happens to us is before we got the base or the foundation spread out wide enough to be able to sustain the blessing of God, we just want to hurry up and get that tower built to God. Babel, Genesis 11. And God looks down there and says, man, what in the world are you doing? What a mess that is. And knocks the whole thing down and confuses the language. Covetousness is something that gets all of us. That was the devil's problem. The Lord, he should have been happy. With tablets and pipes he's created, he was perfect in beauty and in wisdom until iniquity was found in him. What was his iniquity? Covetous. He wanted to be more than God told him to be. I wish you could get a hold of that. Covetousness is what leads to jealousy of other people. Covetousness is what leads to gossip and bitterness. You know why you gossip about other people? They got something you want. Otherwise, why do they occupy so much of your time for you to talk about them? They're not that important. Oh, they don't matter to me. Why do you talk about them so much? You know what you're trying to say? I must be better than they are. I'm, I'm, how come they're getting recognition and I'm not getting recognition? How come you're trying to knock them off the pedestal? Why does it bother you? Maybe God's got them there for a reason. Maybe God's trying to do something. Uh, have you turned to Philippians 4? Uh, go to uh, Philippians chapter number 4. I'll get there in just a second. Uh, verse number, I'm, I'm ready to go this morning if you can't tell. Uh, verse number 11, um, Philippians, that's not the one I'm looking for. I'm looking for the passage that I just quoted to you where the Apostle Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be, com that's it. Verse 11, not to speak in respect of what? Want. For I have learned that whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be, not in respect of want. Here's what I told a young man this week. He's got a lot of stuff going on. He's got some real problems, and, real, and they're real problems. You understand? They're, they're, not, they're not made up. They're not put-ons. They're not, you know, it's not kind of like he's making a mountain out of a molehill. Kind of. he's, got, he's in a real mess, this guy is. He's in a real mess. But I told him this. I said, brother, here's the problem. The problem is it's hard to find the will of God in a position of want, not need, want. I want, I want, I want, I want. And the next thing you know, you just disregard whatever God says because you're going to get what you want to get no matter how you go with it. And so now you take what God says and twist it around to fit your situation because if you can just get what you want, everything else will be okay after that. You'll get it all settled down. You follow me? So sometimes what happens is, is we get messed up. Look in Hebrews chapter number 13. Do you remember the fellows over there in Luke chapter 17? Uh, Luke chapter number 17, the, the, uh, the leaping lepers over there. You know what happens to them? Hebrews chapter 13. They cry out to God, and one of them comes back and, and gives glory to God by saying, thank you. You know what we do as individuals? We take God for granted. 
When the last time you were thankful for where you live, for the health that you have, we're never satisfied with what we have. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the morning, but as we get older, you know what happens? You keep wanting to look at pictures of what you were like when you were 20 or 25. Amen? In your mind you do. You're thinking, you know, well, I was a lot thinner then. Well, you know what happens is as you get older, the hormones get messed up and you get, you guys are the same way too. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, you've got this big old thing, your chest done drop down to your drawers and you're, you know, you're walking around and you look like wimpy, ate too many hamburgers and all. And you go to the gym, but it's like you can't sustain it like you used to sustain it. And you work out and you work out and you work out. You let it go one day and pff, it's like somebody hit you with a, a hat pin and pff, all the air came out. Uh, as you get older, you start looking at this. Well, I, I wish I could move like I used to could move. I wish I could walk like I used to could walk. I wish I could run like I used to could run. I wish my hair wasn't turning gray. You say, that's not true. That's why you dye your hair, ladies. I don't care if you dye your hair. Don't go out. The preacher says, if you dye your hair, you're wicked. I didn't say that. I don't care if you wear well makeup. Every bar needs some, uh, some paint on it every now and then. Helps to cover up the rough spots. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> You, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not satisfied. See that that thing is constantly. I, I wish I had. I wish I. If I could just get another car. If I could just get another house. If I could just get. A, if I could just get a better job. If I could just get another piece of this. If I could just do that. If I could just. You know what happened? The Bible. The Bible's true when he says, "Don't covet your neighbor's wife." You say, "Why?" You get to watching what goes on around here. You get to think, "Well, if my wife was like that, you don't know what that woman's like." You see her for two or three hours in an entire week. You know what she's like when she walks out this door. She might be Satan spawn for all you know. And you say, well, I wish my husband was like this and I wish my husband... You're just using that to manipulate your husband to be what you want him to be instead of what God wants him to be. Ladies, you're natural manipulators. Uh, some of you got mad at me the other day and you did. You got mad. You can call it upset or whatever. You got mad when I said, ladies, you have a problem that you want to talk all the time. That's why the Bible says it's natural for you. Men don't want to talk. They slap things and hit things and show their anger and isolate themselves and act stupid like that. But here's what happens. The Bible says, the Bible says that, a, that a woman who's adorned with a meek and quiet spirit, why does he say that? It's a great price to him. You say, what? It's an abnormal thing. Don't get mad at me. He says that for a woman to study to be... Why? It's not natural for you any more than it is natural for a man to study to learn how to communicate. You're going to be married, here's your little marital counseling. Men, you've got to learn to study to communicate, to talk about it, to talk it out, to sit down and listen to them talk. You don't ever listen to me. You don't ever pay. I'm hearing every cotton-picking word you're saying, lady. i got everything you just said, man. You know, like that. You've got to study that. Y'all, y'all are, you, you, know, just, you know, you look like you're going to constipate this morning. like... Why does he say that stuff? Because it's where you're living. And ladies, your problem is, is that you have a hard time being quiet. Now, it doesn't make you wrong, but he says you have to study. You have to learn how to do that. There's a time and a place for everything. And sometimes it's not a good time to talk. And men, there's a time for you to learn how to talk. You say, why? Because you love them. You get older, buddy, you better learn about talking. It ain't all the physical uh, junk as you get older. It's communication. You're with them as you get older, not because of the outward attraction, but because of what you know about them on the inside. And fellas, you ain't going to learn what they're like about on the inside unless you listen to what they say and learn how to figure out what it is they're trying to communicate to you. You say, why? They don't talk like you. They're on another planet. They're made that way. So you got to, the Bible says, dwell with a woman according to what? That means you got to study some things to find out. What, and they're different as snowflakes. Every single one of them is different. Are you in the book of Hebrews? Aren't you glad we're there? Hebrews. Somebody gave me this. I can't let it go to waste, so please don't be offended. Hebrews chapter 13, on verse number 8. I'm sorry, that's not where I'm looking at. This is the... Oh, where am I looking for here? Give me just a second here. Sir? That's it. Thank you. That is a five, by the way. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, verse number five. Let your conversation be without what? You know what he's indicating there to you? 
he's indicating that a lot of times when you're talking to somebody else, it's because you're trying to get something. Let your conversation be without covetousness. You're not trying to close a deal. You're not trying to get something. You're not trying to be... He said, let it be without covetousness. What do you want? You're coveting what they got in their pocket. You want it for yourself, so you cut whatever corner you got to get to get it. Amen. Good preaching. And the Bible says, and be what? With what? Such things you have. All right? Are you content with the things that you have? Everything you have? You happy with your body the way it is right now? You stand in the mirror in the morning, and you're like, who's that? What happened to him overnight? Something happened to that guy. <laughs> Ma'am, are you content with your husband? Or will you not be content until you can get him conformed the way you want him conformed? Trouble. Trouble. Gentlemen, are you content with your wife? You say, preacher, why is that important? Well, the reason that's important, come over to uh, James chapter 1 while we're here. Come over to James chapter number 1. You want me to tell you why that's important? You know what being a lack of contentment leads to? It leads to covetousness. You know what covetous leads to? It leads to lust. You know what lust leads to? A mess. You say, what is lust? It's not just a physical desire. It is wanting something that you don't have. It's not just lust in a sexual sense, to just be straight up with you because the kids aren't in here. Lust is, I want that job, I want that promotion, I want that recognition, I want that voice, I want that, th whatever it may be. Whenever you're not content where you are, you start lusting after things that you're not supposed to have. Trouble, contentment, that's what the 1828 describes as peace of mind, completely relaxed, happy in the state that you're in. Most Americans never, never get enough, never have enough, never be enough, never get enough recognition, never get enough uh, attention, never get it. It's, it's always the cup is half empty instead of saying, hey man, I got what God wants me to have. Right? Well, how come they got more? Where'd that come from? You don't think the Apostle Paul's walking around after all the stuff he went through and after he lost everything he had? You don't think he's walking around watching people that are more wicked than him that have got... 500 times more than he's got. You don't think Jesus Christ is walking down here. He says it. Birds of the air have nests. Uh, uh, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Y'all got houses. You got lands. You got cattle. You got wives. I don't have none of that stuff. He don't say, well, how come he gave it to you and he didn't give it to me? You know what Paul says about being married? He said, well, I would that you were as I am, but I don't covet you being married. If you want to be married, be married. Better to be married than to burn. No big deal. I'm not going to covet it. God's given me my lot in life. I don't know if that's what your lot in life is. Fine. Help yourself with it. But you see that comparing yourself among yourself and measuring yourself by yourself, he says it's not wise. You say, why? It leads to covetousness. James chapter number 1, if you're there, I know where James fits doctrinally. I understand dispensationally. It's to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. I understand that. Do you ever, you ever, ever wonder about that thing about complaining? you ever look at Job? You know, what the, you know what the devil says about Job? Well, yeah, I guess he is your, uh, blessed by you, but you've got a hedge of protection around him. I mean, you've given him everything he wants. Take everything away from him. You know what Job does? Naked I came in the world, naked I shall leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He don't complain about it. Thank you, Lord, I got it. I'm sorry I don't have it. You know where the devil tries to get in there? The devil tries to get in there and say, yeah, well, you only worship God because you're getting what you want. Where did he get that idea? He got it, Genesis chapter number 1, in the beginning when he said, I want that and I won't be happy until I get it. And he just figured Job must be just like him. Sometimes we're the same way, aren't we? I'm just trying to tell you, neither were they thankful, the Bible says in Romans chapter number 1. The Bible says, who, when they knew God, they, they didn't worship, they served the creature more than the Creator. Neither were they thankful. We're, we, 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 we stop short, Lord, thank you for church, and thank you for a Bible, and thank you for a pew, and thank you for air conditioning, and thank you for a car, and thank you. But, but Lord, now, now that I've got the thanks out of the way, it's Thanksgiving, right? Lord, thank you for what I have. But, but while I've got, after I got that away, Lord, could I have, and could I have, could I have, and could I have, could I have? It's not happenstance that Christmas follows Thanksgiving. You say, why? Because you've got to have somewhere to take all the wants to go. Lord, I sure am thankful. 
We used to have a tradition in our house. We'd sit down with the turkey and all that other kind of stuff. Sometimes we'd have something besides turkey, but rarely we'd have turkey. And we'd go around the table. What are you thankful for? And 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 that wasn't the time to throw out a wish list. But as soon as the last piece of turkey is eaten and the leftovers are done and all the turkey sandwiches are made and the pumpkin pies ate and everything's put up and so on and so forth, and then Monday morning comes, the next thing is, I, I want this. What do you want for this? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Wouldn't it be a blessing if everybody on your Christmas list this year said, I don't need nothing, I'm good, man, I'm doing great, man, just keep it yourself, spend it on yourself, no problem. Wouldn't that be a blessing? (laughs) You know what Christmas usually is for most people? Not for everybody. You know what it is for most people? You don't give to people because you really care about them. You give to people because they're going to give you something, and you don't want to feel like, well, they gave me something, so i got to give them something. So it's this reciprocal, and then it's like, well, they spent 50 bucks on me, i got to spend, I'm just being real with you. So I got to, you know, well, they got me this, so I got to get them something. And then there's this last minute rush, you know, out there. Oh, God, somebody gave me something. I got, I didn't get them anything. And that's why everybody's running around yanking their stinking hair out of their head at Christmas time because you're trying to figure out who might give me something this year. You know, your Christmas lift is growing. You think you're successful because you think more people like you. Yeah, but don't, don't, don't keep buying them off and see if they like you next year. See how many people still give you a gift if you don't give them something this year. I'm just being honest. Well, you can give me nothing, so I ain't giving them nothing. Well, after all I've done for them, they could have at least given me a card. Or, here's a good one, all I got was a card. You're shaking the envelope, you know, and you're like, must be a gift card in there. I'm sure they would have, they intended to put a gift card in there. Right? Must be a check stuck to something in there. Where's that? I, I, how do you know? I look in the garbage can. I see the cards that are folded, the Hallmark cards that are 8.5 by 11. They're folded this way and then they're folded this way. When you see them in the trash can and they're opened all the way up, it's a clue. Somebody was looking on the inside for something they didn't see when they first opened it. They thought it was hidden back in the card. Y'all are looking at me like you're snake bit, man. Y'all are like, oh, Lord. James chapter number 1. Let's talk about this. Watch what happens. Verse number 4, but let what? Stay it with me, please. But what? Have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire. <laughs> uh. Now here's the truth of the matter. You're, we're, we're, we are all, we are all about as spiritual as a gnat. We don't want God as much as we want other things. So don't try to flip it around. Well, preacher, there's nothing wrong with wanting God. You know that's not what he's talking about here. You say, why? Because here in just a second, you know what he's fixing to say to you? He's fixing to get into some things here. Look down, if you will, please, in verse number 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of what? He's wanting something that he's not supposed to have his own lust, and enticed. So what happens in the passage right here is, is if you watch this, verse number uh, 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. If he's satisfied, if he's content where he is, he's not looking at things he has no business looking at. He's not trying to turn something that he has into something that he thinks he'd be happier with. You say, if my wife, 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 God knew exactly what you needed. See, you don't think so. Well, she needs to fix and she needs to do and she needs to change. God knew exactly what you needed. That's why He gave you who He gave you. Ma'am, He knew exactly what you needed. That's why He gave you what you gave you. You say, yeah, but if I could... No, no, see, see, there's the problem. And that's where that manipulation comes in. Well, if I can get this comparison here, if they they could just be this way, if they could just be a biblical husband, I would be happy. Really? Well, that doesn't say a lot about your your uh, your ability to reason and your choice that you made for along the first uh, along when you first chose them. You thought they were the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's funny how when you first got married, when you first met them, you overlooked all their problems, and now all you can see is their problems. Right? I got news for you. You live with somebody 25 or 30 years, you're going to find out their socks stink just like everybody else's. 
and they got nasty habits like everybody else's, and they don't do take out the garbage or do the things you think. In your mind, you're thinking this is a Harlequin romance. This is a this is a Hallmark day. This is a Publix commercial. And then you find out they got the same kind of junk going on in their life that you that you that you that you only thought was in you know other people's lives. You're like, how can this be the same person? This same person you married is human. So she. She gets older. You wake up one morning. It's like, oh God, who are you? Where'd you come from? Wig laying on the table, false teeth right over here, you know, false eyelashes over there on that kind of a thing, teeth over there in the, in the bottom of a glass over there looking like that. Quick, honey, put your, put your wig on, put your teeth in, man. Oh, my God, what happened to you? The same person you married, you just don't see it, see. But when you get in content, you know what you do? Please listen to me. You know what you do? You start picking at everything you don't like because you know what you're doing? You're going to justify the next move you're fixing to make. What you're trying to do is to say, well, under the circumstances, it's okay because he, she, they aren't. So in that case, you're setting yourself up. You're not being tempted by the Lord. You are looking at something. You are lusting after the Lord's like, whoa, 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 you're going to be drawn away. In other words, what he's kind of saying is, is that whenever that thing gets a hold of, what they do is, is he takes that lasso like this, and when you get within range, just like a guy on the back end of a horse, when that cow gets in range, all of a sudden he lets that rope go, and you know what happened? Drawn away, hooked up, pulled in that direction. You're done now. It's only a matter of time as that rope gets shorter. And then you know what happens? Lust, when it's conceived, bringeth forth what? Well, there's your problems in 90% of the relationships today. There's your problem with the situation as far as the Lord's concerned. You look at the Lord and you say, Well, Lord, how come I'm not preaching? And how come I'm not going to the mission field? And how come I'm not singing? Or how come they recognize that and didn't recognize this one? And what about this? And what about that? I mean, it goes across the board. And then you know what you start doing? You start looking for things in your own personal life to justify going to where you wanted to go in the first place. And when you do that, it blinds you to the real truth. The very thing that can help you. You say, what do I need to do? Lord, I need to be thankful. First Thessalonians chapter 5, you don't have to turn there. He says, in everything, give what? Now, why would he say that? Because it says, when I say thank you, I'm content. Thank you doesn't mean I'm just being polite. Thank you means I'm satisfied with what I have. Thank you. Satisfied. The, the man in Luke 17, he comes back and he said, Lord, I just wanted to say thank you. You know what the Lord said? The Lord said, that's giving me glory. You mean saying thank you is giving? Yeah, because you know what that guy did? You've got to get this in Luke 17. That guy's saying, I'm just thankful that I got my, my leprosy stopped in spite of everything it took from me, my nose, my fingers, my toes, my ears, whatever's gone. I'll live with the scars the rest of my life. I'm just thankful I'm healed. But he wasn't whole. He wasn't whole until after he came back and said, thank you for just doing what you did. He didn't come back and go, I mean, you know, look at the scars. Why couldn't you do a, a, a facelift? Why couldn't you add some things on? And why couldn't you make me look normal again? You know what he did? He just came back and he says, look, I, I'm just, I just appreciate you doing what you did for me. I'm happy just like I am. Thank you is saying, I'm satisfied. You ain't got to do no more for me. You know what we say? Thank you, but uh, how come you did more for... You say, why are you telling me this? Because what I'm trying to do is take the book of Revelation. Man, we got pretty deep into some doctrinal issues the other day. But what I'm trying to tell you is the cherubim learned something by watching the devil. They said, you know something? I know why the guy that used to be the boss over us got in a mess. None of those four cherubim say, I want his job. You know why? They looked at that and said, man, there must be trouble that goes, a responsibility that goes. There must be a temptation that goes with being up there. You say, how do you know? Have you ever noticed in your Bible how many kings fall? Because to him who much is given, much is required. And they're always wanting more. Uzziah, you know what happens? 
He wants more. You know what happens? Uh, David, he wants more. All through the Bible, Saul, he wants more. There's part of that that goes, you know what they do? They look at that guy and they say, huh, I don't want that. Not a single one of them. You know what they're saying? Holy, 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 holy. Maybe mackerel in there in between, you know, but holy, holy. You say, why? They're filling up their mouth with, Lord, I'm just grateful to be up here. Lord, I'm just thankful to be up here. How do you know that? Because the Bible says they were giving thanks. They're so busy giving thanks for just being who they are, where they are, doing what they're doing, that they look at that and they say, I don't want to be like that, man. I'd wind up in the same mess he got into. I'm not interested in doing that. They also learned the second thing, because the devil not one time has it ever said about him that he ever said, Lord, thank you for making me perfect in wisdom and beauty. Thank you for making me with tablets and pipe. Thank you for encrusting me with the jewels you encrusted me. Thank you for the leadership position that you gave me. Thank you for creating me, making me, and putting me into position. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for allowing me to rule over the earth. Thank you for allowing me in the presence of you. Not one time does the devil ever say thank you. That's why all through your Bible, that gratitude is the thing that prevents the covetousness that we all struggle with so bad. Never happy. Never content. Always looking for more. Can't stand it when somebody else gets more than we get. I don't know if you've ever done this before. I certainly have. You drive by, <coughs> excuse me, you drive by a church out here, First Timothy chapter number six, and they got uh, you know five thousand members. And you drive by there and you think, Lord, we've been going twenty years and we ain't even got five hundred. What's up? Lord's like, why are you asking that? Why don't you just be thankful that you got anybody? Ugh. You say, yeah, but you're just desiring to be more pleasing to God. No. The Lord said, I didn't ask you to worry about that. I give you who you need to have. And you guys as a church over there, I'm doing what I need to do. Just be thankful you got what you got. Quit worrying about what everybody else is doing. Remember in the old days? I, I guess they still do this. Not as much now because you're in a, a, a depression right now. But, but in the old days, they'd had this thing called keeping up with the Joneses. And what happens is, is if that was if the neighbor bought the car, you had to buy the car. And if the neighbor bought another house, you had to buy another house. And if they got something for their wife, you had to get something for your wife. There was always this comparison. If they got the promotion, your wife put pressure on you to get the promotion. And if they're going up, you got to go up. And well, how come he got stars and you don't got a bar? And, and all this, uh, that thing going back and forth. And the Lord's saying, hey, why don't you just be thankful for what you got? You know what you could be? You could be slime in the bottom of a mud hole somewhere. You could be a drunk somewhere. You could be, but you, you ain't doing so bad. Why don't you just be thankful? You know what that is? It's looking at the Father and saying, you don't know what the heck you're doing. You have no idea what you're doing in my life. God said, really? You don't think I know what I'm doing? I'm, I, really? Well, how would you do it different? Oh, no, that was the devil that said that. I don't think you know what you're doing in my life, and I don't think you're being what I need to be, or I'm being what I'm supposed to be in my life. So here's what I think that you ought to be doing in my life, and unless you do that, I'm not happy, and don't you dare expect thankfulness from me. That's Laodicea. I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's the last church. I got to have a boyfriend, I got to have a girlfriend. I gotta have a different job. I gotta have a different car. It goes on and on and on. What are you looking for that? Why don't you say, hey, you know what? I'm glad I got what I got. Yeah. Fellow said one time, he said, uh, um, can you explain something to me? And I said, I, I don't know. I don't know what the question's gonna be. And he said, uh, how come that I live a better life than people that I know and I'm riding a bicycle to work and they're driving nice cars? Why would God do that? I said, what made you think is God? I said, how do you know that the devil didn't provide that stuff for him? And how do you know that if you didn't have the car, and how do you know if you didn't have the car, and how do you know if you didn't have the car that you would use it for God and it wouldn't get you out of fellowship with the Lord in a heartbeat? I've seen people all the time. You know what that Bible teaches you? Look in this thing in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. That Bible shows you something about yourself. That covetousness is a mess. 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse 6. Godliness with what? What does it say? Godliness with contentment. So not just contentment, it's godliness with contentment. You see that? You don't really have to have me draw you a picture of what godliness is, do you? Pretty much get that. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and certain we can carry nothing out. That's real liberty right there. 
Hey, I ain't going to go work 500 million hours to try to get me one more thing, one more, uh, uh, one more uh, 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 trinket or whatever. I, I, ain't, I ain't taking it out with me. I, I wish I'd have learned that 30 years ago. Spend half your life trying to prove to everybody you're not lazy and you're ambitious and you're successful because you work hard to get as if having the possessions mean you are. And then when you get older, it's like, I wish I could like get rid of all that. I ain't got time to take care of all that. I don't want to take care of all that. And now you can't get even half of what you paid for all that. Right? And now you want them to downsize. Wouldn't it be better if we just downsize in the beginning? And then that way when we get old, we don't have so much to get rid of. Just suggesting... Uh, if I was reading one thing, you know, kids, I, I, if, there was, if there was something that I could tell you, I would tell you this. Don't get consumed with what other people see as success. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's, good. That's what the Bible says. People say, well, if you get this and you get this and you get this and you get this, oh, you know what happens? We're so bad about it. We pull out those pictures and say, yeah, my son, he just got the big promotion and he's doing this and he's doing that. Now, what they're really saying is, is I must have been a great parent because look at my son. Of course, they're bragging on their son, but it's really... Yeah, yeah, I wish your kids were like my kids because, you know, I'm, your kids are whatever they are in spite of you. Amen. All right, now watch this thing. Watch what he says. Uh, and verse number 8, don't throw up, Paul on epistle, and having what? Having something to eat and clothes on your back so you ain't got to run around naked. Be, cont- be what? Oh, you got to be kidding me. Be content with that? Lord says, yeah, if you get anything above that, it's good, but... I'm telling you, just be content with that. You say, why? Why is he telling you that? It's not to restrict you. It's to protect you. It's saying, look, if that's all I choose to give you, be glad you got that. Because until you get in a position where you can be thankful for nothing, God can't give you more without you getting into trouble. Because you don't know how to handle nothing, you won't be able to handle everything. Remember over there the, uh, the, the, the five barley loaves and the two fishes? You know what the Lord does? He blesses. That means He's thankful. That's what He does. He blesses the five barley loaves and two fishes. What is this among so many? The Lord said, well, I'm going to be thankful for it anyway. We at least got five barley loaves and two fishes. Lord, you can't feed 5,000 men, let alone the women and children. If the, but the Lord says, yeah, but let's be thankful for such things as you have. And guess what happens? I'm going to preach on this a little while, in a little while. Guess what happens? He blesses it and then he breaks it. And the more that he breaks it and tears it apart and rips it apart, the further it's dispensed. You see, we don't want that breaking part. We don't really want God to show us where we really struggle, where we really got problems. A little quiet there. I hope it's because you're listening. Verse number 8, having food and raiment there with be content. Now watch, verse number 9, he doesn't say there's anything wrong with being rich. Look at the mindset. But they that will be rich. Now I didn't say this, God said it. They that will be rich, that don't mean if you're poor as a church mouse, you're more spiritual and somebody's got something, they're just more, uh, they're not as lazy as you maybe. Let me give you the flip side, I gave it to you on Wednesday. He that provideth not for his own is worse than an infidel. You got a responsibility to get out there to sweat to provide. Do you understand? Well, preacher, I got to have more, and I got to have more, and I okay, fine. They that will be rich fall into temptation. Why do they fall into temptation and a snare? In diminished, foolish, and hurtful. How about that? So what happens is, is that I have a desire to have because my security is going to be in what I have. Not working out so good for you in the United States of America right now, but the, the desire is going to be for me to have so that I got, I, I got everything, oh, I got all my bases covered now. I'm good. I'm ready to go. And the Lord goes, hey, 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 hold on just a minute. You're opening the door up to many hurtful lusts, temptations. What do we know about that? That draws us away from the thing that's the most important. When I don't have, I have a tendency to be closer to Him. When I am content in not having, I'm even closer to Him. When I don't have, but I desire to have, 
I've already turned my back and started moving in a different direction because I'm saying, God, if you really love me, you'd give me. And God, if you... I don't know about you, but I'd hate to be married to a woman like that. I'm not kidding you. Honey, here's what I made this week. I worked 40 hours and doing the best I can do. That's all you got? Yeah? All I got. Well, I know so-and-so, and I know so-and-so. That's all I got. So you know what happens? You try so hard to please her, and next thing you know, you're out working 60 hours a week, and then 80 hours a week. And you say, why? Because now you're, you know what you are? You're a slave, because she's only going to be happy with what you provide. She's no longer happy in the provider. Can I make a quick switch for you? When you first met Jesus Christ, you were so grateful that He saved you. You didn't care about nothing else. And you didn't complain about nothing else. You thought you were lower than whale poop in the bottom of the ocean and you couldn't believe the Lord would even take it, even stop and turn and even look at you to save you. And you hollered out and said, Lord, save me. He said, okay, I'll save you. Nobody else wanted you. Nobody else wanted nothing to do with you. And you said, man, this is the greatest thing I ever had in my life. And you went up there to Calvary's cross and you said, man, if you'll have me, the Lord said, I'll have you if you'll ask. I'm asking. He'll say, I'll take you. You get up from there and say, man, I'm washed white as snow, man. It's really something, boy, and it's really wonderful. This is all, this is the greatest thing in the Lord. And it's a very short period of time that our prayers turn from thanksgiving to. Now, Lord, the way I see it, there's people listening right now, and there's people that are in this church sitting here right now, and people that have been here, and your prayers have changed from, Lord, I sure do appreciate you, and I sure do love you, the provider, to, Lord, I don't understand why I don't have anymore. You know what that is? I will ascend. I will be like the most... I want something that God... Does. Be content with such things as you have. Are you understanding me? That's saying, Lord, I'm thankful. I'm breathing air. Some of you, you bust your... You, uh, you, you break your back to try your best to get something. But you know what? If you were laying right now in a bed with oxygen tubes stuck in your nose and doing everything you could to breathe, you could care less. All you want is, is to be able to take a breath in comfort and to let your heart beat without it hurting or let your knees, or let you walk without your knees aching. All that other stuff all of a sudden don't matter to you. You take for granted the things that matter the most. I'm able to see. I'm able to hear. I'm able to taste. I'm able to touch. I'm able to go. I'm able to do. I'm able to be. I go to bed at night. I get up the next morning. I got a roof over my head. I got this and that. We, no, Lord. Well, uh, Lord, I want. I want. I want. I want. Lord's like, man, what if we change things around and rockets were falling in Jacksonville? What if we turn things around and troops were moving onto your border this morning? Would it maybe change your concept? Suppose somebody in your family this morning wakes up and they start coughing up blood. And you rush them to the hospital and they walk in and say, Well, it's emphysema, it's lung cancer, well, it's this and that and the other. And all of a sudden, you know what you realize? I don't care if they go to work anymore. I don't care. I just want to get them well. I just want to get them well. Yeah, but what about the money? What about the provision? What about all the things? What about all the stuff? How are we going to get all the toys? I don't care about all that. I'd give all that away if I could just have my breath back. I just want to get back where I'm in love with the provider. I've, I've gotten away. Not thankful. I think I deserve more. Why God do this to me? Back up. Amen. Neither were they thankful. Why did God do this to me? How come God didn't kill you and put you in hell? How come God didn't make you walk with a limp? How come God didn't make you the ugliest person on the planet? How come God didn't make you blind like Bartimaeus? How come God didn't make you have an issue of blood? You say, oh, well, all that stuff. No, I'm telling you, don't you try to justify it. Understand that our problem in the last days is neither were they thankful. God, why did you do... What you're saying is, is why didn't you give me what you gave them? You get half out of your mind. You know what you wish? I just wish I had my mind back. You start missing your memory. You start forgetting things and, and saying dumb things all of a sudden. And you embarrass yourself. You think, I don't know why I just said that. I don't even know. And then the, old, the younger ones have to come in to start taking care of you. 
and holding you up while somebody changes your diaper and you're thinking, I don't really care who gets what when I die or all that, but could I have some dignity and, and, and could I have a little bit of strength and could I have a little bit of health? It's funny how that thing whittles down, ain't it? Because when it comes down to it, you know what? It's just a token of how we are in these last days. Those four cherubim, they look up at that thing and they say, man, I'm glad to be what I am. You know what, if God had made me any more, I probably would have followed Him. You want me to tell you something right now? You never sing a, see a single seraphim, you never sing a single, see a single ter, uh, cherubim that follows after the devil, you only see the angels follow. I think that's interesting. You say, why? They had to be content right where they were doing what they were doing. They didn't want any what anybody else wanted. They didn't want to do what anybody else was doing. They only wanted to do what God wanted them to do. In the presence of God, they said, hey, this is good for me, man, I'm good. Well, the devil's getting up a group, and he's fixing to cut out of here. How'd you like? Would you like? Now listen, the devil's been over these four guys, these four beasts, since the beginning of time. Do you understand that? The devil is getting up a, a, a crowd. We're going to have an insurrection here. You know what them cherubim say? Holy, 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 holy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, but wouldn't you want to entertain? Ah, holy, holy, holy. Uh, 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 uh. Don't get, get out of my face, man. I'm, I'm happy right where I am. You know where the devil gets us? The same way he got caught. Covetousness. Lack of contentment. Got to have more. Got to be more. Got to do more. Father, bless your word this morning. I pray you'll help us with these things and that you'll uh, bless the upcoming uh, uh, service. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, hope that helps you. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, let's get ready for the morning service, please.